of you have ever been referred to as being either right-brained or left-brained? These labels don't have much significance to us as adults, but as young people, as children, whether you are right or left hemisphere has everything to do with how you learn. Now, I'm going to simplify this a little bit. But children at a very early age who are left brain dominant, left hemisphere dominant, tend to be able to hear and decode sound, particularly speech. This means that they are early speakers, they are early readers, they are usually good writers and good spellers. Children that are right hemisphere dominant have a whole series of additional other skills. and qualities. They do, however, not have the ability to particularly hear and decode speech. And it usually means that if you're right hemisphere dominant, you had problems with speaking, or you were a late speaker, and you had problems reading, and you had problems writing and problems spelling. Now this is something that affects about 20%, roughly, of the population, to one degree or another, about 5% it affects severely. And when it affects you severely, it's called dyslexia. Dys meaning difficult, lexia with words. The thing that makes it a problem is the very fact that our educational system and how we measure intellect is pretty well determined by words, by books, by how well you can write, how well you can solve math problems, how well you can increasingly take information off of a computer screen. Great if you're left-brained, a big problem if you're right-brained. I'm dyslexic. I realized very early on that I was going to have a lot of problems with reading and with doing math. As I look back at that time, I realized my father was dyslexic as well. He was an artist. He taught me how to draw, how to paint, how to work with tools, and for that I will be forever grateful. But the only intervention available back at that time for me was to fail first grade. And I carried that inability to work and do math and to read with me all through my education, I was generally moved into what was called the slow track, which did not prepare me for college. And so when I surprised everybody and wanted to go to college, I was really ill-prepared. And in fact, I was so ill-prepared that I had uh, basically spent two of my first three semesters uh, on probation. With time, however, I eventually began to improved my grades by taking art courses, and I had the blessing of having to take art history courses. Now, art history can be very, very dominating sort of uh, subject to have to study. It can be very tough. I had the great fortune of having some wonderful instructors, and those instructors not only, you know, took me under their wing, they, they mentored me, and they believed in me, but they were all great storytellers. And there was something about their storytelling that I just loved, and that I was able to absorb their, that information into my very dyslexic head. It was the beginning of me realizing that if I didn't have to wrestle with the mechanics of reading, my retention of the material that was being read could go way up. Somebody read to me, I gained a lot more out of it. Years later, I would fall in love with books on tape, and it gave me an opportunity to really catch up with everybody else. So, with the help of these mentors, I got through and got a bachelor's degree. I immediately moved to Hawaii and enrolled myself in the Asian and Pacific Art History Program at the University of Hawaii, and with the help of other great storytellers and mentors, I managed to earn a master's degree. Years later, I found myself 
chairman of a small art department. I was teaching sculpture and art history. And during the summers, I was teaching as an adjunct at a much larger institution where I was teaching a series of non-Western art classes. In the year 3000, or 2000, I was given the opportunity to, as a part of my teaching contract, to return to school. I thought, what the heck? I enrolled in a Master of Fine Arts program to become a sculptor. I had at that particular point realized that the optimal career for a dyslexic included entrepreneurship, design engineering, architectural design, any of the performing arts, be it dance, theater, or music, and art. I was in the right place. But what to sculpt? What to make? It took me a while to realize that I had stories inside of me that I could take and encode into objects for the public to decode. Sort of a dyslexic's revenge, you know, the kind of reversing <laughs> things. The first real piece that I did that with was this one. It came as a result of a trip that I took in 1989 with my then six-year-old son. I spent an awful lot of time trying to keep him from being run over by bicycles. We went to the Netherlands. And we also visited the Dutch National Forest, which was about the size of a city park with only a few trees in it. And I realized that the Dutch were trying very, very hard to live within their means, trying to balance their crowded little country with preserving the environment. And the bicycle was very, very much a symbol of their efforts to do that. I think you can begin to see what that encoding was a little bit. You know, I mean, bicycle equals person or human, and tree, plant equals nature and the environment. I began to see bicycles as a tremendous metaphor for humanity. After all, there were very few cultures that you don't find bicycles in. Among the, uh, oh, I continued to uh, put these up. I still make bicycles related with uh, plants. I've taken to using bonsai because uh, they're a lot easier to handle. But I think also that uh, humanity tends to want to control and manipulate nature. And so the bonsai is a good example of that. And I think these two pieces depicted here express that need to balance, if you will, the human with the environment. Some of the stories I found inside of me came from a very, very early age. And I can remember as a child being fascinated when I was introduced in, a, in school to these guys. And the idea of two people living within the same body really interested in me. And I, I didn't lose that interest. Years later, I found out that the Bunker brothers married a pair of identical twin sisters and proceeded to uh, father about a dozen children. I thought, well, that had to be a pretty interesting home life. <laughs> so I thought, taking this, and I thought I would try to use the metaphor idea, again, with bicycles. And so I created this piece. I'm always fascinated in how kids react to my work. And I can usually go up to a, a, any young person looking at this piece, and I'll test them. I say, what do, you, what do you see here? And they invariably will give me a nice narrative as to what this is all about. And they can about 80, 85% of them can do that. It's because the bicycle to them is very much a tool of their imagination. They can all remember when the bicycle was a car or a horse or a fighter plane taking them away on great adventures. A lot of adults will look at it and say, but how do you ride it? <laughs> I also began to think about other artists who had, before me, experimented in using bicycles. And of course, this gentleman always comes to mind, the great Dadaist master, Marcel Duchamp. In 1913, he created his bicycle wheel and stool, as seen here. He was quite an innovator. He took ready-made objects. He would reassemble them and put them together which hadn't been done before. 
but he would also invite his audience to do more than just look. He'd say, you know, come up and spin the wheel. Get involved in the kinetics of what the piece was like. And in 1913, this was pretty outrageous stuff. I always thought it would be interesting if I had had a chance to really get to know Duchamp. I had read a fair amount about him, and I thought, if I had known him, it'd be fun to make a present for him, make a bicycle present. Now, he wasn't a really very active guy. He's kind of sedentary, plays chess a lot, smokes his pipe and cigars. But I thought, I've got to make something here that would make him want to go bicycling. I'll make him an exercycle. So I created this piece. It had to have, make, you know, absolutely no sense. Rear view mirrors, even though it wasn't going anywhere. You know, a lot of those sorts of things. But I had thought also reading about him that he was pretty chauvinistic. And I thought it might interest him to want to get onto a machine that was like a large male appendage that he could <laughs> sit there and crank away and, and get all these wheels turning. So I've also realized that there were other opportunities and that I could, with the idea of utilizing bicycles, express concerns about politics and some of the things that are going on in the world. In 2006, my wife and I moved to South Africa where we lived for a year. And I felt great concern for the people of Zimbabwe who are flooding across the border, escaping the economic deprivations of their country. As a result of that, I created this piece. These two tandems put together actually form the flag of Zimbabwe. And yes, Robert Mugabe is more than 30 years there, took Zimbabwe, which was at one point the breadbasket of Africa, and absolutely destroyed the economy. So there's no room for anybody to ride, no seats, no bars. Front brake is locked to the back brake. But even more than that, I thought it, I wanted to express how badly the economy had been destroyed so in the inflation, there where you put the inflation instructions on the tires, I took each tire and put the inflation rate for one week in a year between October and November of 2008. By the end of the th uh, third week of October in 2008, this was the annual inflation rate. By the end of October, this was what it was up to. By the end of the first week of November, and eventually by the middle of November, it had reached this staggering amount. As most of you have heard, Mugabe was finally removed in late 2017. Needless to say, Zimbabwe still doesn't print money. I think you can begin to see where I'm going with a lot of this. By now, I'm sure that several of you can look at this and say, it's a self-portrait. It is. It's me. It's what I was like 10, 12 years ago. And many things have changed. But yes, as a dyslexic, I still feel I am going through life, like a lot of us, with only one brake and one gear. But you do the best you can. And for me, my art has let me stay in the race. It's the human race. There are all too many who are dyslexics who have dropped out of that race. Dean Braganier, in his excellent TED Talk about dyslexia, points out that some 35% of all young people who are dyslexic drop out of school before they finish high school because of frustration with an educational system that will not adopt to the right hemisphere that dominates their life. I've often wondered where dyslexia falls in the terms of human evolution, and I've come to realize that before we were a literate society, we were an oral society. We were dependent on an oral tradition for survival. 
And the keepers of the oral tradition were the bards, the minstrels, the artists, the shaman, and the storytellers. When that was all swept away and we became a literate society, those people were replaced by the scribes, the copyists, the librarians, the writers, and the readers. Please understand that if you ever give a dyslexic something to read, they will not read words. They will see symbols that need to be decoded. They are not dumb or stupid or lazy. That was a far easier title to be called a dyslexic when I first heard it in college, rather than stupid or lazy. I've made a partial list here of dyslexics. I would doubt if any of you would ever look at this, anybody on this list and call them stupid or lazy. In conclusion, I would simply like to suggest a couple possibilities to you. You all know that young person who is maybe socially uncomfortable, who doesn't, maybe has a learning disability. Take time, get to know them, talk to them, find out what interests them, encourage them, and befriend them. The difference that you can make if you taking a little bit of time can be the difference between them being that 35% that drop out or maybe another name on this list. Even closer to home. If you happen to be or have a child that is dyslexic, tell them stories. Tell them rich, vivid, magnificent stories full of information, full of details that they can carry with them. But even if you're a great reader and you can read to them every single night, and you've got all kinds of stories you can read to them, I'd like you to do what my father did for me. When he would read to me and he'd get to a point where he really couldn't push through anymore and the weight of the words had become too much for him, he would simply stop, close the book, and turn to me and say, and what do you suppose happened next? He would invite me to engage my imagination and to create the narrative path that would get us to the end of the story. Thank you, Dad. Thank you. <laughs>